changing at a rate that we've never seen before. From business to art to sports, these changes are affecting every aspect of our lives. My name is Nick Kastner, and we're setting out to talk with the people who are altering the way things are done. Along with Alec McChesney, this is The Commonwealth. Our guest today is Donald Everett, president of Runza. If you aren't familiar with the fast food chain Runza, you've obviously never been to Nebraska. In 1949, Donald's grandmother opened the first Runza restaurant. Decades have now passed since that first store opened, and Runza has become as synonymous with Nebraska as corn or football. Throughout our discussion, Donald shares his perspective on creating new menu items, their path to growing the food chain, and the company's approach to passing the business on to the fourth generation. Ladies and gentlemen, Donald Everett of Runza. My guest today is Donald Everett, the president of Runza. Donald, how are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for coming over, Nick. So first, when um, I was describing a Runza this morning to someone who wasn't from the state, the person I gave was um, in and out is to California, and what, what a burger is to Texas, Runza is to Nebraska. Is that fair? I think that's totally fair, and we, we feel uh, blessed to be in the company of those great companies and have a niche that is solidly you know, in the state of Nebraska. Yeah, yeah. Um, how, how many stores does Runza have, just for a sense of? Sure. We have 86 restaurants. Um, most of them are in Nebraska. We have one in Colorado, Loveland, Colorado, uh, one in Kansas, Lawrence, Kansas, and then a couple across the border in Iowa. Okay. Um, my favorite menu item is the ranch. What do you put in the ranch that makes it taste so good? You know I can't tell you these secrets. <laughs> <laughs> I would buy it by, uh, by the bottle if, yeah. if I could. You know, there's there's no big secret on the ranch or really any products, but if you make them from scratch and you make them on a daily basis, it makes all the difference in the world. Okay. The the staple food item for Runza is the Runza. What what is what is a Runza? You know, I always ask my kids this um, because I want them to feel fluent in the Runza language. But <laughs> it's ground beef, cabbage, onions, and special spices baked inside baked inside homemade bread. So. I always, some people call it, oh, it's like a Hot Pocket, and I just cringe when I hear that. (laughs) That's, you know, a microwavable product that that we don't aspire to, but I think a calzone is more apt description for the uninitiated. Okay. Um, And so it's, you know, it's a dough and rope product, and, uh, you know, it it has a lot of ethnic heritage to it and evolution, um, Mm -hmm. you know, in, in, in Europe, and my family are, you know, Germans from Russia, and and you know migrated over here many years ago and uh, along with many other germans from russia and uh so they all made us uh products very similar to that mm-hmm. say as much yeah so when was the first runza sold first runza was sold in 1949 uh, my grandmother opened up her first her only restaurant um in 1949 and you know she made them for her family um before 1949 and and Again, many other Germans from Russia made a very similar product. They didn't call it a Runza, but uh, she was encouraged by others to open up her own restaurant. Um, and she had a brother that w- had come back from the war and was kind of floundering a little bit. And she thought this would just be a great project for them to do together and for him to be involved and give him a sense of purpose. And of course, in 1949, the traditional role of a female was not entrepreneur Mm -hmm. um, or business owner so that was kind of charting new territory and I think our generation kind of forgets that that was a unique um, circumstance at that time but she was uh, she was a unique person and uh, yeah so she owned the first runza in 1949 and sold the first ones there. Uh, Sally was was your grandmother's name right? Yes. What did she have to say about being an entrepreneur in that time? You know she was very humble and she I don't believed it was unique you know for her it was just this is what I did to provide for my family. Her husband worked um, for the railroad, and, and I think did just fine working for the railroad. But, um, you know, she had four children, and once, you know, they were of a certain age, I just think she felt a sense of purpose helping her brother more than anything and didn't really see it as this is outside of the box and opening a business. Um, I think to be an entrepreneur, you, you can't see those those lines those those that, that, that the public kind of, the box that the public would put a person in Mm -hmm. and she didn't see those so to her credit um you know i don't think she realized it would be 86 restaurants someday or had any sort of vision beyond that um it was just a single family restaurant for many years yeah Uh, and she was the one to come up with the name runza correct she is and she was smart enough to trademark it 
Wow. Um, and, you know, there were a variety of other um, names for products very similar, a pierogi, um, beer rock, kraut runes. Um, there's other, I think, German names for very similar products that are dough enrobed with a variety of ingredients inside mm-hmm. of them. Um, and, and she Americanized uh, that recipe with a little more ground beef than would be typical. Uh, and, of course, kept the cabbage in the recipe and, and uh, ultimately trademarked the sandwich name as well, you know, the namesake of the Runza restaurant. So. Okay. Is there a meaning behind behind the name, or was it just some, something she stumbled on and liked? Or? You know, there, there is no meaning behind the name, and, and I, wish I, had, I wish I had her here to give me a little <laughs> bit more history on it. But I think there's a lot of folklore, uh, you know, a lot of people say, well, I remember it was called a Runza before 1949, and, and I don't have any independent information to, <laughs> okay. to confirm or deny. But, uh, but you know, she trademarked it, and, and it's, it's served us well. It's kind of an odd name, of course. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean anything. Um, but, uh, you know, it's unique. It's, it's two syllables, and people can remember it. Yeah. So unless you're ESPN and call it Ronza or whatever the the broadcaster uh, named it, uh, couldn't pronounce Runza. He said Ronza. Oh, on College Game Day. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, was, I don't know. It was some some other ESPN report before College Game Day, the recent College Game Day in Nebraska, but it was, became a meme and it was just kind of a crazy deal. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sally opened that first store in 1949. When did the second store open? So it was a single restaurant uh, chain, if you will, <laughs> for 17 years. And it really was a place where my dad and his siblings, he has three other siblings, um, worked in the family business, helping their mother um, and uncle run the one restaurant in, out near Pioneers Park here in Lincoln, Nebraska. So it, it was really, it was, it was nothing, quite honestly, for 17 years. Uh, my father, though, uh, he, he left after high school and, and uh, moved to Miami um, Florida, worked for the Miami Herald newspaper and and went to Day Junior College and and uh, ultimately decided to come back and help his mom run his restaurant. He wanted to play football for the University of Nebraska, mm-hmm. so he walked on as a freshman and played freshman ball for uh, Devaney. And uh, ultimately, he recognized school was not necessarily his lane, <laughs> and uh, kind of neglected the the academic part, but but excelled at the football part and. Mm. Um, left school, helped run my uh, grandmother's restaurant for a couple years, and ultimately decided, you know, I want to open another. I want to open a second Runza on on the uh, would would have been the east side of town, and with her blessing, and she loaned him I think five hundred dollars, and off he off he went, opening up uh, his first Runza restaurant in nineteen sixty six. Okay, was he the manager of that second one? Was that kind of his? Like, Absolutely, he's a manager yeah. owner. Um, and, and, you know, obviously wouldn't have done this without his mother's blessing, but, uh, he, he would tell you it was wildly successful from day one. Hmm. Um, and he, you know, they developed, I suppose, a following at the first one. And, you know, if you weren't traveling to Pioneers Park for the day, now you could get one in East Lincoln at 56 and Holdridge, um, which that store is still there today and wow. been renovated several times. But, yeah. um, another thing that, you know. A couple of generations don't wouldn't couldn't even imagine, but these didn't have drive-throughs. They didn't have dining rooms. Hmm. These were you walk up and order and get your food. Um, or in the case of Fifty Six and Holdridge, it was car hop service. You would, you know, kind of like a Sonic. Okay. You would, uh, you know, have a have a wait staff come out and take your order, take the order inside and and bring out food. So it was a unique, you know, restaurant or unique times really because drive-throughs weren't a thing. Yeah. So we've come a long way since then. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so from the the mid '60s till today, runs has experienced remarkable growth. Like when when did the when did the third store open and fourth? Like how how did that growth start to play out? Well, it wasn't it was not immediate, and I don't know that my dad had visions of you know being eighty six restaurants or whatever. Um, but the the third restaurant was nineteen seventy, so it was another four years before hmm. he opened another one, and it was in Omaha, Nebraska. And uh, you know he just grew the business as he grew his people. Um, you know, as people grew up in the business, my dad was a very confident, um, influential leader in that people wanted to follow him and somehow believed that we could sell more of these cabbage pockets, if you will, in other destinations. And, uh, 
they were excited to to be a part of it. Um, in fact, his best man in his wedding uh, ultimately bought his Omaha location several years later. My dad said, "Why don't you why don't you just buy this one and you move up there? Maybe open a couple more locations." And that was kind of a pattern. It was people that you know one, one of the franchisees that uh, is still with us today. My dad just met him playing basketball down at the Y. Wow. He needed a job, and my dad said, "Why don't you come work for me?" Um, and you know, today he has five or six runs of restaurant franchises and does very well and comes into our office and visits us all the time. Yeah. So it's a, it's truly a family business, not just, you know, not just myself and my sisters and my mother, but uh, my dad always said, these are my family members. These are my extended mm-hmm. family members uh, involved in the business. Yeah, when, when I walked in, the people at the front desk said the same thing, that it, there, there's a family component to working for this family business. Well, we so. pay them to say that. Yeah, yeah especially <laughs> the visitors. Yeah, exactly. Um, so what percent of runs of stores are franchised today? Um, about 55 to 60 percent okay. um, are company-owned. The other 45, 40 to 45 percent are independent franchises. Okay. So and they license um, the name, and they're typical independent franchisees, independent business owners. And, uh, you know, so we, we own and operate. We're a management company, and we're a franchisor here mm-hmm. in, in Lincoln with our corporate facilities. Okay. And how, how did that franchising start? Well, that started in 1979, so that would have been 13 years after my father opened his first location. Um, and honestly, my dad had no idea what he was doing with franchising, but he had people interested because he had some success. Mm-hmm. They knew they didn't want to necessarily work for him, but they had enough money in the the management um, plan in place to open up their own runs. And, and honestly, the first couple were kind of a disaster. Okay. They weren't qualified. Um, they didn't know what they were getting into in the restaurant business. Um, and ultimately, my dad bought those first couple ones out because um, they weren't having a lot of success. And I think that was in Grand Island. Um, there was uh, he did the same in Scotts Bluff and Loveland, Colorado. So it hasn't been seamless. That you know, mm-hmm. it hasn't been a, a trajectory. Um, you know, in a, at a forty-five degree angle, it's it's had its ups and downs. But uh, you know, fortunately, my dad just never believed anything would ever fail, and he just had you know the gumption to keep working hard and and you know holding on to these assets. And one of the key components, I think, to our success is is early on he owned the real estate for each of these um, stores. So everywhere we've developed runs, as especially company-owned ones, um, and most of our independent franchises, we, we try and own the real estate. Um, it just gives us more margin for error, and, and if the economy has its ups and downs, we, we've got a leg up because we're not you know, paying 8% of our sales or whatever mm-hmm. it might be um, in monthly lease payments. So. So anyway, it hasn't been seamless, um, but but thankfully we've had some really good people come along that are good operators that have had some capital, and my father's enabled them economically to do that too. So, uh, you know, that that's why we are where we are. Okay. So now, kind of shifting um, shifting gears to your career with the company. When um, when did you start working at Runza? Well, I started working at Runza when I was twelve years old. Um, which probably broke some child labor laws back then, <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. But, you know, my, my parents, I mean, we're a family business, and every dollar my dad made, he was plowing it back into the company to open the next restaurant so that he didn't leverage um, his assets uh, very much. So, you know, it's not like this is why he didn't give us an allowance, but he's like, I didn't have an allowance. Why would I give you guys an allowance? Mm-hmm. Go work at Runza. Yeah. And we were all too happy to. Um, in fact, we were probably, we probably would have, worked there if we were at age 10 but he's like you guys are a little too young you know (laughs) gotta be able to see over the counter as he always said (laughs) Uh, so anyway I started out making onion rings on Saturday Sundays on the weekend and and, uh, age 12 was was the starting point okay and then I'm I'm not trying to find out how old you are but what period of the company was that when you started well we would have probably had maybe 20 15 to 20 locations and that would have been well. That would have been about when we started franchising, 1979. Okay. Yeah. As the company grew and and the the runs of footprint expanded across the state, how how did you see that affect business? You know, it was always a pretty slow, controlled model for us. Um, but 
there, there's a difference between being an entrepreneur and running a business, in my opinion. Okay. An entrepreneur, uh, as, as my dad was, was really, he, he had that squarely in his DNA. He wasn't great at, at maintaining organizational structure. So it worked for quite a while to kind of be haphazard with the growth and, and that kind of thing. Um, but, but it had its hiccups, and certainly the people that grew up in the business, I think, um, were, were a bigger part of the decision-making process in a franchisee, franchise, or relationship than is, than is typical. So I would just say, as, as my time has evolved in the company, we recognize the importance of, of becoming a little bit tighter structure and having, mm-hmm. uh, you know, our franchisee, franchisor relationships more formalized. And, and uh, you know, that took a little time. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. What were all the different roles you, you had, had in the company as you grew up? Sure. Well, I worked in the restaurants in a variety of them from age 12 through my college days at the University of Nebraska. Um, so 12 to 22, I was just an hourly employee, closing supervisor, those kind of things. Um, but when I started in the office, when I was 22 years old after graduating from the University of Nebraska, um, I became what we call a district supervisor. Mm-hmm. So I oversaw about a dozen of our restaurants. Um, so I would travel frequently to those restaurants. I would oversee the management. I'd hire. I would fire. I would um you know, review their income statements, and and we still have those positions today. But ultimately, um, that was my initial position in this office. Um, and I have two siblings in the business. I have a twin sister who was, you know, district supervisor at the same time, a, a, an older sister that um, oversaw our, our accounting department and ultimately started up our HR department. And uh, so we all kind of grew into – department heads at, at one point in time. Um, I, I oversaw our construction department, um, our franchise department. I was franchise director at one point in time and ultimately became the president of the company in 1997. So I was 30 years old at that time. Um, so I've been president, I guess, for 22 years. Okay. How valuable was it to have your hands in all the different components of the business? I'd say extremely valued and probably more so in the operations side, having a deep appreciation for what goes on in our restaurants on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, when you make food from scratch, there's there's a lot more operational procedures that, that need to be executed well in order to maintain consistency. And so I was con- I've always constantly thought of how can we how can we make this better to better enable our stores to um, perform at a high level. Um, and I think the fact that we own and operate more than half of our chain also makes us influenced to make decisions that are best for the company. Like if we're going to release a new logo, a new signage, we're putting our foot forward with, you know, 50 restaurants and putting up new logos and spending 20000 a location. And it's a big capital investment. But our, sure. our independent franchisees respect us because we own those stores. We know how to operate them. And they know that we're putting our money where our mouth is. Mm-hmm. And that's not the case with most franchise systems. Yeah. Um, what was it like moving, um, moving into the role as president? Honestly, it was, it was, I'd say, just fairly seamless. My father was always willing to give us responsibility. Um, he, he made us earn it, but he didn't mind letting us, you know, have responsibilities and make mistakes. Mm-hmm. Um, it was only a couple years after I started in this office that he turned over the board of operations, um, which is just our informal board of making decisions for a company, um, to us. He would come into the meetings every once in a while. He'd read the meeting minutes, and you know he was certainly critical at times. Um, but I'm thankful that he was here for those seven years between 1990 and 1997 to mentor us uh, and let us fail a little bit. Um, those, those are really um, great years for us to kind of own our skills and to gain the respect of, of our peers and our franchisees and people that were older than us mm-hmm. um, and had been in the business um, full-time longer than us. So it, it was those are really useful years. But by the time I was named president, it was, it was kind of an informality, I would say. It was just at dinner, hey, I think you're going to be president. Renee's been <laughs> vice president. 
um, you know, she's busy with her family, so, uh, you know, but we, we treat each other as equals and, mm-hmm. and we have equal say in the business. Yeah, what was the, uh, what, what was the biggest le- leadership lesson that you got from working with your dad? You know, I, I would say by far the biggest um, thing he passed on to us was lead by example. Whenever I would travel around with him to our restaurants, um, it wasn't to go meet with the manager. It was to go, he would go directly to the grill, show the, the, the young employee how to salt and pepper a hamburger. He would grab a mop and show um, an employee that mopped the entire floor is his theory of map, mop, mopping half the floor until that dried and then mopped the other half so customers could still walk by without slipping. He just got into the granular details and mm-hmm. and people respected him and really appreciated him for leading by example down to really some some pretty menial tasks in our store in our stores and that's what he enjoyed he was probably a better teacher than he was a business person and that ultimately translated into business success hmm. fascinating so moving into uh, into runs of today and where uh, where the company is at what does growth look like for runs like are you all opening new stores um, if so are they in nebraska or are they sure. are they out are, are you looking to expand we still have some communities we want to grow into nebraska okay um but we do want to grow um outside of nebraska and we've we've there's almost like this imaginary berlin wall around the state of nebraska because we are kind of a nebraska thing it's an Mm -hmm. asset but it's also a liability uh but we've had some really good success with our out-of-state stores where we are right now um we've stubbed our toe in a couple other places like moline illinois and las vegas and sioux falls south dakota and Hmm. in the last 25 years but um we're building around those areas where we have really good name recognition where we have good sales base um, we're, we'll be opening a store in the first half of next year in Longmont, Colorado, with an independent franchise group. Um, that looks promising. They want to yeah. open more stores. And so I, I think you'll see us continue our maybe three to five stores a year and, and continuing to grow where we have good name recognition because the Runs of Sandwich, at the end of the day, is a unique product. Mm-hmm. Some people love it, and some people don't love it. Hmm. And we have to live with that. That's, yeah. that's who we are. That's what we are. Um, but we got to figure out ways to lead better with some of our other products that we think we do well. Yeah, where are those places that outside of Nebraska that runs uh, does really well in? Like Denver with Loveland, yeah. Colorado. Okay. Um, so Front Range of, of Colorado, uh, um, Lawrence, Kansas, a good college town. We do well there, and then we're in Council Bluffs is, is barely Col- or barely Iowa, but we also are in Clar- Clarinda, Iowa. Okay. Um, so you know we, we think we. We have an opportunity, especially in some of the smaller communities where name recognition, although it's important, it's a little easier to achieve that that scale fairly quickly in you know towns less than 100,000 people. Okay. Um, and of course, it doesn't hurt when you have some Nebraskans in the area that, mm-hmm. that appreciate your product and have that built-in sort of knowledge about Runza and know that we're deeper than just the Runza sandwich. While I was waiting before this interview, I read the Wall Street Journal article on the wall that um, there were some people from New York, some Nebraskans living in New York that would drive to Nebraska just for Runza. It's, it's pretty fascinating how, um, how like I've had, I've heard about people shipping Runzas across the country. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's annual events in, in Washington, D.C. and New York um, that they serve, you know, Runza and Valentino's Pizza. And so we coordinate those shipments for and with them. And, mm-hmm. and sometimes we even send out staff to help man those events so that, that we're, we feel good about the product that's being served. Yeah. Um, but there's always alumni events that are going on that we try and be a part of and, and spread the good word or bowl games. Mm-hmm. We were out in Boulder for um, a tailgate function that had 2,000 people there, and we, we couldn't produce enough runs of sandwiches yeah. out there to, to satisfy the crowd. Yeah, and, and you were working that booth, correct? Uh, I, I was. And, <laughs> yeah. and quite honestly, knowing that we're opening a store in Longmont, which is not very far from Boulder, I thought this would be a really good outreach opportunity. And it's always amazing to me when we go to some of these events how excited people are that, that aren't uh, don't have runs as available to them every day. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've never been that passionate about food, but, but there <laughs> yeah. are some crazy people out there. Uh, that 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 really get excited about this little calzone, you know, that, that we call a runs a sandwich. Um, it's it it's invigorating. It reminds you that there's 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 interest out there, and 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 we need to continue to grow our company. 
Let's take a quick break so we can tell you about a live event we have coming up. On Thursday, November 14th, we are hosting a live recording at the Foundry in Lincoln, Nebraska. Happy hour starts at 4 p.m. At 5, Senator Anna Wisher is hosting a 20-minute long question and answer session. At 5.20, I'll interview Ali Schwanke, founder and CEO of SimpleStrat. The event will close by the same time happy hour ends, which is at 6. Check out our Facebook page to learn more about November 14th's event. Now, back to the show. Uh, what are communities in Nebraska that you still don't have runs as that you see moving into? Sure. Um, you know, Alliance is one of those towns where I think we should have a runs that's a big enough community. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're even opening up into some smaller communities like Milford, Nebraska, for example. We just opened up one there maybe a month ago. And that was a unique opportunity for us. It's a very small community. It's got a nice little community college. But um, we started there with a modular drive through only building. And so it's drive through only in a walk-up window with a nice little patio area. And it's doing reasonably well. And so we're, we're kind of tracking that kind of model to see if there's some other opportunities for even some smaller communities that just don't have a lot of restaurants coming into town um, and see if there's enough um, enough interest to support you know that model mm-hmm. so I also went to school <coughs> at the uh, University of Nebraska and Runza was the staple uh, staple restaurant in the student student union yep. and in 2018 the university decided not to renew Runza's contract in the student union sure First, could you give us some like context and background on that event, and then and then walk us through on how that affected your relationship with the university? Well, I mean, it was a ten year lease, and you know the university has a little food court in their student union, and and we were a part of that, and we were thrilled to be a part of it. To be quite honest, um, as a graduate of the University of Nebraska, and my two sisters graduated from the University of Nebraska. My dad played football there. My mom took interior design classes there. It was kind of personal, right? I mean. Mm-hmm. Emotionally, we had a lot invested into the location, um, and we were we've we were proud of our relationship with the University of Nebraska. Um, at the end of the day, they made a business decision to bring in a couple um, other restaurants to take our space. I think they made a bad economic decision, a bad decision for the state of Nebraska. But you know, I'm obviously biased mm-hmm. and perhaps a little less than objective when it comes to that. <laughs> yeah. um, but it definitely was a pillar of our relationship that's gone and and. I hope there's another there's a day that you know the student union gets remodeled and they they go forward with their plans to which they do have some plans to someday um, make that a great showcase for for the university and entry point. But you know if that happens someday we'd love to be back. But um, you know short term it it kind of hurt. Um, mm-hmm. But we know it's you know it's it's business. The university yeah. is a an institution that makes decisions for their own reasons and and we have to respect it. Um, but it hasn't affected our other relationships with the university. I mean, we're still big supporters of the athletic department. Um, but every dollar we made at the student union, we plowed right back into the university, whether it was through scholarships or capital campaigns or through our sponsorships. And that economic resource isn't available to us anymore. And I think I would just challenge any other company that does business with them to do what we were doing yeah. and put every dollar that they're making off the university right back into it because that certainly was our philosophy and and so so it hurt but you know it's a business decision for them and and ultimately you know we're we're not going to call sour grapes on it we'll continue doing what we do at the university and mm-hmm. and frankly it's still good for our business right to be involved with uh, football games and yeah. and uh, volleyball games and that kind of thing so we're happy to be sponsors and it's it's all good yeah yeah what's the relationship with the athletic department look like both football and volleyball uh, any nebraska sports game there's sure. runs at it's re- we have a, we've had a really good working relationship with the athletic department um regardless of who's been in charge as athletic director in fact bill moose stopped by just last week just to say hi oh wow um and so we chatted for about 45 minutes i showed him uh, our office and and uh you know so we had a nice little chat he he is one of those guys i think that gets nebraska mm-hmm. there's not many out-of-state folks that I think understand us or it takes a while to understand Nebraska I think he gets the culture here he gets um, you know what's important to Nebraskans Um, we have some good leadership over there Mm -hmm. so uh, no we've had a great relationship with them we continue to you know push our product out through those venues and they've 
they're very supportive, and, and we just have a great win-win relationship. So the kind of overarching theme of our show is um, trying to uncover how different people approach doing something new. And I was interested to learn all the different like food items or yeah. or concepts that, ha- that have been tested while you operating runs that. Can can you walk us through a few of those? Sure. Well, we've had some good ones. We've had some bad ones for sure. Uh-huh. Um, we just recently introduced um, the vegetarian runs a sandwich. A couple of them actually. Okay. Um, and you know, customer palates are changing, and they're certainly recognizing the importance of mixing it up a little bit. Um, so we're trialing that right now. Um, we have a, a, we call it the original vegetarian runzo, um, which is lentil beans and cabbage. Tastes very similar to a regular runzo sandwich huh. um, for, for those that, that have tried a, a ground beef one. Um, and then we also have a black bean Southwest runzo sandwich, which is excellent too. Um, so those are ones the verdict's still out on, but, you know, we, we've tried a lot of things and a lot of menu items, but I'll just say before I move on to the other ones, it's so important, we believe, to be comfortable in your own skin with your restaurant concept and, and focus on those core products. Because at the end of the day, runs of sandwiches, fries, hamburgers, those those account for 80% of our sales, okay? Mm-hmm. So the other things are noise, and you've got to make sure that whatever you're adding to that menu isn't a flippant decision. you got to consider how it's going to impact your execution of those other products, um, so, but we've, we've had cheesecake on a stick. I have no idea why we did that. Okay. Um, it must've been a weak moment. It must've, must've tasted good at the food show, but, okay. uh, you know, we no longer have that kind of thing on the menu, but you know, we've added over the period of time. I mean, we didn't used to have entree salads or even kids meals, hmm. but those are things that are just, those are table stakes at restaurants. You got to have, you got to have some variety like that. And, uh, but we also, I've had some fun with adding products like Frings for those that are indecisive and want a little bit of French fries and a little bit of onion rings. That's been a really popular offering. Um, you know, we've we've added to not just the regular Runza but the Swiss cheese mushroom Runza. Those are natural evolutions that don't take away from our core executions, um, and those those will continue to be permanent menu items. Yeah, the uh, the vegetarian Runza. How do you go about creating that? Like, for, I, I assume the first step was like assessing the need of vegetarian, like serving vegetarians. Right, right. Well, we we get a lot of requests for products. You know, it's like, you know, that are that aren't meat based. I mean, we mm-hmm. get those requests, and you know, they're a pretty loyal. We we suspect they're a pretty loyal group of people. I mean, what kind of? I mean, until the Impossible Burger was at Burger King, you really couldn't go through a drive-through lane and get anything other than a salad. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that wasn't meat-based. So so we wanted to expand those offerings, and we feel like there might be an opportunity there to fill a very specific niche, again, without impacting how we execute our core products. Um, so so I think, you know, those are this is one of those evolutions in time where people's palates are, I think, truly, truly changing. But we don't go for every fad, whether it's Atkins diet or, mm-hmm. um, you know, gluten-free, I think, is a real trend that, that has some some stick to it. Um, but it's so hard for us to execute properly something like gluten-free just because we're making runs of sandwiches with flour in our stores every day. Yeah. And it's an airborne, you know, product that, that we just we couldn't possibly promise gluten-free in our restaurants. Your comment on the the other other product launches being noise and that, that, that it can distract from the core offering mm-hmm. is, is just interesting. Uh, well, it's so important. You know, it, and our, this is where we're, we're operators, too. And mm-hmm. so we recognize it's important to execute speed of service. It's important to execute really good hamburgers. And if you're, you know, you're not adding staff to execute a product and, you know, they have to execute a wider breadth of menu items, it just becomes that much more challenging to do what you already do really well. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've been more and more careful about sticking true to our core products limiting our LTOs, our limited time offering products, um, because they don't stick around. And really, what's the point if they're not driving sales? Mm -hmm. Um, So we're pretty comfortable in in our own skin. And I think those those kind of conscious decisions are exactly why our same store sales continue to climb incrementally every year. We've been very blessed that way. Yeah. So do you think Runza will continue to stay in the family when beyond your time with the company? Well, 
I would just say yes. We're positioning for that. Okay. Um, we're in the gen- our third generation of, of of operators with with myself and my two sisters. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've beaten the odds there. Yeah. Generation four, I think the the success rate is like four percent. Hmm. We're actively planning though with um, a family succession um, institute, and they they've helped us along that pathway. But ultimately, we we intend to continue to be privately held. We intend to continue it being a family business we wouldn't have built this this new office building for example or you know we we could milk the cow a little bit more than we do we mm-hmm. we've rebuilt several of our restaurants that have been around now for 40 years wow. we have several more planned to be torn down and rebuilt in the next three years um we don't mind reinvesting in our business and we feel like it's it's you know you, you can't you can't continue your business without reinvesting in it. And we're, you know, having 86 buildings, um, it's a little bit capital intensive and, and we want our customers to recognize, you know, that we have great facilities, we have great service, we have great people. So we're, we invest in, in, in each of those. Um, and that's, we're doing it to be around for another 70 years, not to, yeah. you know, sell out in five years because we're getting older. Yeah, what does that, um, what does that succession planning look like? Like oh, at, at a broad enough, um, scope that you can share with. I'm not trying to get in. The, well, we're in navigating right that right now. We're we're learning best practices, to be honest, um, with with how to pass this on to another generation. Um, I think we were pretty fortunate. My dad wasn't a big planner, as I've mentioned. <laughs> yeah. um, so so you know, I think we've been fortunate to keep this in the third generation without you know any sort of um, you know fractious activity. We we get along really well. We respect each other's lanes, and, mm-hmm. and we, we each have different responsibilities within the company. But we, at the end of the day, we have a ton of trust in each other. So the next generation's eight eight kids, mm-hmm. um, age you know sixteen to twenty six or twenty seven. Um, some of them work and go to school out out of state. They may never want to come back. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're we're positioning ourselves to make sure they're informed of what it takes to run a business what Runza looks like, the different components and enterprises within um, Runza, and, and at the end of the day, opportunities that might even be adjacent to, to Runza or might just be something they're interested in. Mm-hmm. But we're kind of viewing ourselves as more of a private equity company or an enterprise rather than just Runza restaurants. We feel like we've got a lot of talented people or kids growing up in that fourth generation, and we want them to think big. Yeah, interesting. So, a final question: If you could go back to when you were twelve and could hardly see over the counter runs that, and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? Um, that's a good question. Uh, you know, my father was an entrepreneur, and I don't think I appreciated that enough at the time. And I felt like I was always trying to kind of rein him in. He was like. If he were a thoroughbred horse, I was riding him without a saddle mm-hmm. at times. He was really hard to control. Um, and I think I should have embraced that a little bit more um, because at the end of the day, every company has to have that creative entrepre- ent- entrepreneurial um, energy and leadership. And I think I've developed that over a period of time and, and recognized the importance of it. But you know, when I first started with my dad in the company or working at the office full time, it was always trying to control his crazy ideas. And and I, I'm, I'm hoping Gen 4 doesn't do the same to me and squash my enthusiasm. <laughs> yeah. But but honestly, I think I, sh- I could have learned more if I'd have just, you know, paid attention more to that and the importance of it in a business. Um, we were at a stage at that point in time where we needed some formalities in our company and some processes to to the business. But, at, you know, we still needed um, creative spirit and entrepreneurship. And he brought that every day. He didn't really listen to me. But I, I think I could have learned more from him that way. Okay, fascinating answer. Yeah. Um, and thank you for coming to the show with me. On my way out, I'm hoping to um, steal that, uh, steal that uh, ranch recipe. We'll be looking so. after you. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thanks, Donald. Thanks, Nick. That will do it for today's episode. Thanks for listening. We would love for you to subscribe to our channel and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also like The Commonwealth on Facebook and follow Alec and I on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. We release episodes on Mondays, so stay tuned for next week. 